This is uh, from Sergio Luis Alfonso. What a nice name. Wow. From Bulacan, Philippines. Wonderful yes, I like that. I, I thought he'd be from Italy, but he's from the Philippines. And the uh, scripture is Philippians 4, 4 through 5. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. The year 2020 was a hard year for everyone. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Amen. In my country, we experienced turmoil, not only because of the COVID-19 pandemic, but also because of political unrest, which we are still experiencing. Every day seems a nightmare, and I feel little peace in my heart. I can relate to the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Philippians. He was in prison, and the church in Philippi was worried about him. He used the form of the word rejoice 13 times. Why would he speak of joy when he may have been about to die? For Paul, joy and comfort came from the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. Even in the toughest situations, God is near us. And that nearness gives us comfort and joy. I've experienced a number of challenging situations. I failed the CPA exam twice. The university I was working with closed, probably because of COVID. My parents both work at a bank and thus are at a higher risk for COVID-19 exposure. However, Paul's words remind me to rejoice even in these stressful times, because no matter what, Jesus is still our savior. Even though we experience pain and suffering, God remains faithful. We can find joy in that truth. And in our rejoicing, God gives us shalom, peace. Amen. Well, let's pray. Dear Lord, your peace transcends all understanding. May our eyes be fixed on your son, Jesus, the Prince of Peace. We thank you, Lord, for giving us joy in our lives and for, for always being with us through every difficulty that we have in our lives. You're there with us when we're on the mountaintop. And you're there with us when we are in the valley and life is uh, just going from one to the other, like a roller coaster. We're thankful that you uh, don't abandon us in the valley and that we are never alone. And uh, as always, as we go through our scripture this evening in Acts chapter 9 and 10, we pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit guide us in its interpretation and seeing how we can apply what we've read to our lives. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. I think we are on verse 32 of chapter nine. Does that sound right? Okay. So we've been reading about Saul, who later becomes Paul, right? We've been reading about Saul and his heart for the Gentiles. Well, he's not alone in that. Peter has a heart for the Gentiles, too. We read about how there was a diaspora of Christians. They, they were spread out because of the persecution in Jerusalem. But the apostles stayed in Jerusalem, except for Peter. <laughs> he, he's out there. And, and so we're, we're leaving Saul for a little bit here uh, in today's reading, and we're going back to Peter. Uh, and Peter is going to visit the saints in Lydda. Now, Lydda is, let's see, 
have that on my phone. You can see that. Okay. Lida is uh, near the coast, but Joppa is even closer to the coast. Can you, is it on that map there? Joppa. 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 Okay. Lida is to the southeast, about 12 miles as you head towards Jerusalem. Okay. So uh, he's decided to visit the folks in Lida. And let's have Paul start with verses 32 through 35. Now, as Peter went here and there among them all, he came down also to the saints that lived at Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, yeah. who had been bedridden for eight years and was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. And immediately he rose, and all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. Okay, so let's stop there. Um, that's pretty typical healing we see, isn't it? So he's on a mat. He tells him, roll up your mat, pick it up, and walk away, because you're not a paralytic anymore. Uh, and he'd been a... He'd been a paralytic and bedridden for eight years. People saw him. He would be out there begging for alms eight years. You can imagine how everybody knew him, right? Um, and so he got up, and that was a, a big witness to the miracles of God and to the faith of the Christians. It says all those who lived in Lydda and Sharon, that's the, like the land mass that's along the coast. Um, they saw what happened and it convinced them, you know, that, that these guys are for real, these followers of Christ They've got power from God. Uh, and, and so a lot of people were converted in that. So that's really a wonderful thing. All right, 36 through 38. Stephanie? Now there was at Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days, she fell sick and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Since Lida was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to entreating him. Please come to us without delay. Okay. So we have a person who is called Tabitha in Aramaic and Dorcas in Greek. Which would you rather be called? I'd rather be called Tabitha than, hey, Dorcas. Us. <laughs> so, uh, but it means gazelle, so it's a pretty name. All right. Um, she became sick and died. She's always doing good and helping the poor. So she was really active doing stuff in the church. Not just, not just stuff within the walls of the church, but she was helping people in the community too. She's always giving, a very giving person. And when she was gone, it's like there's this hole left in the church. How are we going to fill this hole? Because Tabitha is gone now. A lot of people are crying crying not so much for her because they knew where she was going, but they were crying for themselves because she was gone and, and had done so much for everyone. Mrs. Weaver reminds me of her. I was just going to say that. Mrs. Oh, yeah, she Lois. Lois. always doing stuff like that. With yeah. Everybody, everywhere you go. Her and uh, Gracie used to be a lot like that. Gracie. Mm. Mm-hmm. Anyway. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I go all over town and everybody talks good about Lois, you know. All right. So they did what they always did for someone that, that died. They washed her body and, you know, they covered her and prepared her for burial. They would soon be anointing her body. Um, and this was near Joppa. He's in Lydda. Joppa is 12 miles away. So when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, only 12 miles away, they sent two men, urged him, please come at once. Maybe he can do something. Okay, uh, verse 39, Holly. 39. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll just do 39. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Okay, that's quite a commotion they're making, right? I mean, they're crying, they're wailing, they're showing him all the stuff that she made. It's quite a, a bit of chaos there in that room. All right, so 40 through 42, Bill. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called the believers and the widows and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. Okay, that last part is just amazing because tanners were seen as unclean. Oh. Because they're dealing with animal corpses yeah. all the time. And it's a stinky job. They used to have a tannery near where I lived in California in Benicia because there was a river that went by and they would put all the excess stuff uh, from, from tanning the hides and stuff into that river and it would flow downstream. So it was, it was kind of a pollutive process they had there and it stank from what I heard. I love reading local history. Uh, so it wasn't there anymore by the time I lived there. Uh, but that's the kind of thing. He's near the water. Um, he's right on the coast in Joppa. Um, and he, uh, Peter is staying with him, even though he is seen as an unclean person. But Peter is really taking some steps away from the way he was raised because he was raised a Jew of Jews, a Pharisee of Pharisees, someone who followed all the laws to the utmost. And here we see he's starting to loosen up. <laughs> Only because his name was Simon. Oh, yeah. He figured he's got to be a good guy. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> like Simon Peter. <laughs> uh, okay. I, wanted, I want us to turn. This is a very familiar scripture. Um, let's turn to Mark 5. We have to go back, Matthew, Mark. And we'll read, we'll start with reading verses 21 through 24. Um, Ken. When Jesus said, again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake. <clears throat> a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers, uh, rulers named 
Zeros in here. Jesus, he fell at his feet and blood pleaded uh, earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed it around him. And, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had uh, suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors. Okay, let's stop there. So uh, this little girl is dying and he's asked by one of the synagogue rulers, Jairus, to come. And it's his daughter that's dying. All right, now let's start at 35 to the end of the chapter. Beverly? While he was still speaking, a message came from the president's house. Your daughter has died. We're still reading in Mark, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? But Jesus, overhearing the message as it was delivered, said to the president of the synagogue, do not be afraid, simply have faith. Then he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter and James and James's brother, John. They came to the president's house where he found a great commotion with loud crying and wailing. So he went in and said to them, why this crying and commotion? The child is not dead, she is asleep. And they laughed at him. After turning everyone out, he took the child's father and mother and his own companions into the room where the child was. Taking hold of her hand, he said to her, Talitha, come, which means get up, my child. Immediately, the girl got up and walked about. She was 12 years old. They were overcome with amazement, but he gave them strict instructions not to let anyone know about it and told them to give her something to eat. Okay. Peter had been there. He was an eyewitness to this happening. Him, James, and John. Peter heard him. Why, why would he put this in Aramaic? This is in Aramaic. Why would he do that? Because he was there. And I think these words stuck with him for the rest of his life. Little girl arrives, but... Talitha Kum, um, hearing and thinking about the words that Jesus said, and then this girl arose from the dead. Okay, now let's turn back to where we are. This is very, very similar. Instead of saying Talitha Kum, he said, Peter said Tabitha Kum. Very similar, huh? Tabitha Kum. And he had put everybody out of the room just like Jesus had done. He's, he's, he's following the example of what Jesus had done. Now, interestingly enough, before he said that, it says here, that Peter knelt down and prayed. Mm -hmm. So he, he, he probably said, hey, Jesus, remember that time <laughs> back then? <laughs> when you raised a little girl from the dead, how about, how about giving me some of that? And, and that's where the power comes from. I, I don't, can't tell you how many times I have heard other pastors tell me, we had a revival and nobody came. And I said, did you go there and pray ahead of time? Did your church pray for this ahead of time? No. Well, that's why. <laughs> you have to pray. It's like for our VBS. Please pray for our VBS. For the Holy Spirit to touch people's hearts. You can see a flyer around town. But it's the Holy Spirit's work. That is the power. So you have to put in that prayer first. Get the power going. 
And then the miracle happens afterwards. You don't do the, you don't just go up and say, oh, okay, miracle happened. It's not like that. The power is in prayer. And that's why I tell people that are shut-ins, they tell me, I don't know why I'm here. I don't know what I can do for the church. I can't do anything. I say, yes, you can. They're looking at me like, oh, my goodness, what's he going to expect me to do? I said, pray for me and the other people in the church and pray for the lost, that they come to the church to find Jesus. That's what it's all about. That's the power of prayer. And we know that the prayer of a righteous person availeth much. So that good for pointing that out, Paul. Prayer first, then the miracle. You didn't just jump right in. Um, let's see. Okay, so you stayed with Simon. Any other questions before we go to chapter 10? All right. Chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. At the school. Caesarea. Ces that doesn't look like Caesarea. Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. Okay. So he's a centurion. At, at this time, around Jesus' time, a legion would be about 5,600 infantry and about 200 mixed people, uh, cavalry and volunteers. And then you would have a cohort, which was about 600 men, and the centurion was in charge of 100 men. The centurion was the backbone of the Roman army. People looked up to the centurions because they were people that were very brave. They were people who were not scared or angered easily. They had a lot of personality traits. People would look up to them. And in the New Testament, uh, centurions are always cast in a good light. So we have, for example, Matthew 8. Um, 5 through 13. Let's turn to Matthew 8, 5 through 13. And Lua, did you read that? Matthew 8. Five through thirteen. When Jesus had ended Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, My seven lights at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, Shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one go and he goes, and that one come and he comes. I say to my servant, do this and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with just great faith. 
I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their place at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Zacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subject of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, let it be done just as you believe it would. And his seven was healed at that moment. Uh -huh. That's a pretty good positive light that centurion is cast in, right? And then Matthew 27. Yeah, let's turn to Matthew 27. Verse 54. Matthew, Matthew chapter 27, verse 54. Oh, 54. 54. Paul, could you read that? When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the son of God. Okay. So the centurion could see what? many others could not see. Again, Centurion cast in a very positive light. Okay, so let's turn back to Acts chapter 10 again. This Centurion, it is said, was devout and God-fearing. Now, God-fearing was a term. <laughs> when you were called a God-fearer, that meant that you were a Gentile who recognized the, the, that the God of the Jews existed, and they became a follower of our God. Um, they would not worship other gods. They would only worship God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, and that's what this centurion was. So he was not only there, he was converted. Now they could, I think they could attend the synagogues, but you know, at the temple, they had a jet court of the Gentiles, which was far away from everything. <laughs> so it wasn't a whole lot you could do. Uh, at that court of the Gentiles, but um, they were called God-fearers, and, and uh, that's what this man was, and he gave alms, he helped the poor, he gave generously to those in need, and he prayed to God regularly. Now, back then, they would pray to God three times a day. But being in the Roman army, I, I, I would assume that, you know, he was over. Yes. How did that appear to all that were underneath him and all that were above him? Yeah. They must have thought, oh, this guy has really become like the Jews. He's been there too long, probably. <laughs> That's probably what they're thinking. Yeah. Like yeah. I said, you think they'd kick him out. But they didn't. And, and. This guy was really, I mean, see how sharp he was. He could, he could recognize the truth of God when many other people didn't. It's a sharp But the beauty of person. the Romans with lots of gods and goddesses that they worshipped helped create a diversity of, of folks. So maybe he didn't stand up quite so much. <laughs> I hope so. <clears throat> Okay, so um, he is there at three in the afternoon and has and sees an angel of God. Angels are usually the first words out of them are do not be afraid. <laughs> um, 
but but he's you know he's seen it all i, I think he's less afraid than other people but he did he does say in verse four that he stared at him in fear and that's just the way angels are it's a given they're not the cute little like cupids cherubim <laughs> and, you know like okay there's a guardian angel watching over a little girl at night, you know, and all that stuff. And, and they always look like kind of tall, handsome with wings. But there's something about an angel that's kind of scary. It's otherworldly. Well, yeah. If an angel appeared to me, I'd be scared. <laughs> <laughs> you know, ordinary to have an angel appear. So. Yeah. Okay, I think Stephanie's turn. Is that right? Four through uh, six. And he stared at him in terror and said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Awesome. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simeon, who is called Peter. He is lodging with Simeon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. Okay. Ooh. So it's got to go. Um, it's got to go from Caesarea to Joppa, um, and so that's thirty-five miles away. That he's he has to go uh, to send the men. Uh, verse seven and eight, Holly. When the angel who spoke to him had gone. Cornelius called two of his servants and the devout soldier, who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. Okay, so they've got like 35 miles to go one direction, 35 miles back. So let's get, they're going to be gone for a week. <laughs> it's going to be a long wait. Um, and I think it's neat that... Uh, the, the angel recognizes, I mean, he knows about the prayers that have risen to heaven that the centurion has prayed. And he knows the good works that he has done. God knows so much about us, right? It's, it's just reassuring to know God knows the good things that we do. Uh, let's see. Okay. So the angel, when he was gone, he sent his servants there. Uh, and Peter has a vision. Now, it's, it's we're going to see that, that God is working it so that an angel was sent to the centurion and Peter has a vision, and all of this is going to work together. And so you might say, well, why all this roundabout? Why didn't the angel just say, Cornelius, Jesus is real, I'm telling you, <laughs> and I'm going to present the gospel to you. Why didn't he just go to Peter and say, Hey, uh, the foods that were considered unclean before, what God has made clean, don't call it unclean anymore. God's making it clean so that, uh, and, and all of this is making it possible for Gentiles to be saved, right? It, it's amazing how God is taking these things that can be stumbling blocks like, oh, you can't eat pig anymore. You can't eat all these other things that we consider unclean. Now that's all just been, it's like, you go ahead and eat. <laughs> you don't have to give up any food to become a Christian. This is pretty amazing how God is, is making the way for Christianity to spread like wildfire. Um, and amongst the Gentiles of all people, this is new stuff for Peter. 
because the people that they have mostly been meeting so far in our reading in Acts have been people in Samaria. They're half Jewish. They're mixed race, but they understand the Jewish religion. This time, he's going to be talking to a pure Gentile and converting this Gentile to Christianity. This is a new thing. All right, let's see Peter's vision, 9 through 13. And on noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles of the earth and birds of the air. Then the voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Okay, so it's noon. It's one of those prayer times. And he's not only going up to the roof to, to pray, but he's hungry. <laughs> and here he has this vision of the sheep being let down with all kinds of unclean animals, reptiles, uh, you know, Maybe a raven or a crow. <laughs> Things he'd never, ever considered eating before. And God in this vision is saying, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Now, his answer is interesting. Uh, Ken, could you read 14 and 15? Hmm. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Okay. So that is so Peter to argue, <laughs> right? He's always got to have an argument. Like when Jesus says, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to die. Surely not, Lord. Yeah. <laughs> and what does is, what is Jesus say back to him? Get behind me, Satan. Yeah. Oh, get thee behind me, Satan. Yeah. Ooh, that's rough, right? Mm -hmm. But that's so much like Peter. He, he always has an argument. Oh, that's, that's not the way to do it. And he's arguing with God. But it, it's kind of an oxymoron because he's saying, Lord, and lords, the, the people that live on the Lord's land, they do whatever the Lord, their Lord of that land tells them to do. You don't argue. If they tell you, you're going to be part of our army today, you're part of their army. If they tell you, go pick all the crops, you go pick all the crops. Whatever the Lord says, you do it. And here he's saying, surely not. Lord, <laughs> Peter, are you thinking of the word you're using here? I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. Okay, 15 and 16. Ken. 15 and 16. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheep was taken back to heaven. Okay, so three times means it's really important. If anything's mentioned in scripture three times, three. That means pay attention to this. This is really, really super important. And maybe it took three times to get through Peter's thick skull, but God was trying to tell him, right? So was, was he supposed to kill the animals that were in the sheet? No, it was symbolic. Okay. Yeah. Let's say he offered it to him in a different way. Yeah. 
So the point he's making is don't worry about clean versus unclean food. You're dealing with Gentiles now. Well, he, you know, and Peter denied Jesus three times. And here he was offered it three times and he he refused it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> three is not Peter's good. Yeah, and he, that is not his lucky number. Yeah, he denied <laughs> Christ three times. And uh, so Christ gave him three times to say, yeah, like, do you love me, Peter? Yeah, I love you. Do you love yeah. me, Peter? Yes, I love you. A third time, do you love me, Peter? It's like he's ready to cry. Lord, do you know I love you? God take every body personality to realize that you really love them. Yeah. Okay, 17 and 18, Bev. While Peter was still puzzling over the meaning of the vision he had seen, the messengers from Cornelius had been asking the way to Simon's house and now arrived at the entrance. They called out and asked if Simon Peter was lodging there. Okay, Tim, uh, 19 and 20. Okay, while Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. So get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Mm, here's an opportunity. Uh, 21 through 23, Lua. Peter went down and said to the man, I am the one you are looking for. Why have you come? The man replied. We have come from Corinius, the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy, and holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he can hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the man into the house to be his guest. Okay. I have a feeling that Simon the Tanner was Jewish. Oh. Doesn't say, but I have a feeling with that name, right? Simon. Oh. Um, and Peter's inviting them into the house, which is a definite no-no. It, it just wasn't done. You don't invite Gentiles into your house and you don't go into their house. That's how it was seen. And... <laughs> We think, man, that sounds so racist, right? But what their, their way of looking at it was, and it wasn't right, but this is their way of looking at it. All Gentiles, as I've mentioned before, all Gentiles, they looked at as idolaters. So now you're inviting somebody who worships an idol into your house. That's bad news, right? And you won't go into their house because they worship another God. Um, but he invites them right in. So Peter is uh, loosening up. We see him loosening up again. There's a lot that is, <clears throat> and we're going to see more and more loosened up. That God is saying, don't make the Gentiles become Jewish uh, as far as the culture. Let them be who they are, but believe in me. And that is a big thing. But what has never changed is morality. The laws of morality were always asked, even the Gentiles, they were asked to keep the same morals that the Jews had uh, uh, concerning sexual things. Okay, so Peter's going to go to Cornelius's house. Going back to what you just said, though. Yeah. The Gentiles weren't immoral to begin with. <laughs> Were they? Have you studied any of the Caesars? No. Oh, my. 
but oh what I'm saying, my goodness, they they go all the way to the nth degree of sexual immorality. Almost every one of them. Mm. Yeah, study the the uh, Roman emperors. Sometimes it'll it'll be a real eye opener. <laughs> but what about the average gentile? Um, I mean. The way they did things was a lot different. Um, I mean, they believed in you know other gods and everything else, but were they necessarily immoral? There was a lot of immorality that happened because you would have temples that were basically houses of prostitution. You would have plays um, where the women were extremely immoral in just these public plays. Um, yeah, there was a lot of immorality. Uh, and, and there was a lot of slavery back then at that time too. It's too bad that, uh, you know, God takes us where we are and he moves us a step in the right direction. <laughs> it's too bad that we didn't get rid of slave, you know, slavery right away, but I guess uh you know they had to deal with the culture that they were in and get them to start moving uh couldn't happen overnight uh but yeah there was a lot of immorality back in those days uh, in the gentiles uh, okay where are we at now oh they're going to cornelius's house which is 23. Yeah. We'll start out with, well, then Peter invited. Okay, so we had then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. So we'll start out with the next day and go through 26. Um, Paul, is it your turn? 26, okay. The next day he rose and went off with them and some of the brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And on the following day, they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his kinsmen and close friends. When it, Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshiped him. But Peter lifted him up saying, stand up, I too am a man. Uh -huh. Yeah. I think there's even something like that in Revelation where John is bowing down to a an angel and the angel says, you know, don't worship me. I'm not God. Um and then there's a time that Paul is on the island of uh, what was that creek and they're ready to worship him. He says, Don't worship me. Uh, but, you know, Cornelius knows something big's going to happen. So he's invited all his friends and relatives to be there, of course, because there's this huge thing that has happened for an angel to appear to him. Uh, so he wants everybody in on this. Something great is going to happen. Okay, 27 through 29, Stephanie. And he talked with him. He went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit any one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked them why you sent for me. Okay. 30 through 33, Holly. Cornelius answered, four days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately. And it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God 
to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. And then we'll pick up next week with then Peter began to speak. <laughs> Stop right there. Yeah. <laughs> Off the recording.